Right. A very good afternoon to you all and a blessed Sabbath. I want to thank our Heavenly Father, Creator and Redeemer for making this possible. And a special thank you to Christian for the opportunity. My name is Nicolene von Malter and I'm a part-time lecturer at UNISA, that is the University of South Africa in the Department of Applied Natural Sciences. Our specific field is nature conservation and we mainly deal with the ecological management of natural areas. I have a passion for sharing information on the young biblical creation and the objective is to present people and teachers with the other side of the origins argument than only the evolutionary hypothesis which they are currently forced to present. This talk is an introduction uh, regarding the foundation of why we believe what we believe and how evolution and the Big Bang is in contradiction with some well-established laws of nature. We'll also briefly look at irreducible complexity and in biology. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. It seems as though no one believes that anymore. We all remember that story about the frog turning into a prince. You think it's still a fairy tale? Well, what if I simply added a few million years to this fairy tale? Then it would be called evolution. Professor Louis Bonnoir said the following, evolutionism is a fairy tale for grown-ups. Today, from a very young age, our children are being bombarded and confused with the idea of evolution and 65 million year old dinosaurs. In fact, school books are blatantly pro-evolution and the idea of an old earth, while nothing regarding biblical creationism and a young earth is ever factually presented. It is especially our children who should be awarded the opportunity to also investigate the other side of this subject so that they can decide for themselves what is meaningful and what is true. Few people realize that the teaching of evolution promotes an anti-biblical religion because it teaches the exact opposite to that which is revealed in God's word. For example, if the Bible teaches that the earth is approximately 6,000 years old, but all the scientists tell us that the earth is around 4.6 billion years old, should we believe the word of God or the words of people? If the Bible teaches that God spoke complete systems into existence by the power of his word, that he was intimately involved when he formed man, but evolution teaches that everything originated naturally, spontaneously, and by itself over billions of years, should we believe the word of God or the words of people? By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. When Jesus spoke and Lazarus rose from the grave, Lazarus rose immediately. It certainly wasn't a slow, gradual process, because when the author of life speaks, the effect is instant. Jesus rose from death because he is the author of life. He walked on water and he calmed the seas because he is the creator and the master of all creation. God created a perfect world. And before sin, there was no pain, struggle, suffering, or death. Because death is the result of sin. And the fall only took place around 6,000 years ago. How could organisms live and die for millions of years before sin which is the cause of death. Furthermore, at the end of each creation day, the Bible declares, and God saw that it was good, that it was good, that it was good, that it was good, that it was very good. Can death be described as something that is good? Why would God say that it was good if creatures had to die over and over again before the, over millions of years before the perfect creature came into existence? God does not make mistakes. He does everything right the very first time. And certainly, he does not need to conduct a whole range of experiments before the perfect creature comes into existence. Yet evolutionists tell us that people and organisms, including dinosaurs and ape men, lived and died over millions of years before sin 
ever existed on earth. So who should we believe? We have to clear up this confusion because evolution and long time periods is in direct conflict with biblical truth. This confusion is so dangerous that it may even destroy the faith of adults and especially the faith of our children in God and the unchanging truthfulness of his word. Because if we cannot believe Genesis 1 verse 1 as it is written, why should we believe the rest as it is written? We as parents, and especially persons in position of learning, have a huge responsibility to teach the truth to the children that God had entrusted to us. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. Jacques Monod said, Man has to understand that he is a mere accident, while George Gaylord Simpson said, Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Quinton Smith said, the only reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, for nothing. What a hopeless and meaningless point of view. But what does the word of God say? This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. Someone once said, if I didn't see it, if I didn't believe it, I wouldn't have seen it. Hebrews 11.3, by faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. By faith. In other words, the Bible is our foundation, not the scientific evidence which supports it anyway. Some people demand evidence before believing what is written in the Bible. Yet faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen yet. In John 20, 29, Jesus said, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Many people believe that this is about science versus religion. You often hear it said that people who believe in the biblical creation are essentially choosing religion over science, that it's all about science versus some fuzzy duddy, airy fairy tale in the Bible, which is why we need to understand what science really is. Cornelius Hunter wrote, for a fruitful public debate, we need to understand evolution's foundation. We need to understand this because ultimately evolution is not about scientific details. Ultimately evolution is about God. Experimental or operational science is the science with which most of us are familiar. It deals with the comparison and measuring of processes and data that we can observe here and now in the present. So it begins with an idea or a hypothesis, which is almost like a well-informed guess. You think about something and then you commence to formulate a theory on how to test your idea by investigating data to obtain a result. A scientific method is used that can be repeated so that other scientists can test the reliability and accuracy of the results. Neither creation science nor evolution is classified as experimental science, but rather as historical science or the science of origins, where certain conclusions are drawn regarding events that happened in the distant past but where the processes cannot be observed in the present. If you don't have data that can be tested, it remains an idea, a hypothesis that cannot be tested, observed, or repeated. Evolution deals only with the past. It is an unprovable faith in the idea that all things arose naturally by themselves without any miracles as a result of the inherent natural properties of matter itself. Evolution therefore teaches that everything arose without any godly input. God is not required in their hypothesis. 
This evolutionary process continued over billions of years and was accompanied by struggle, suffering, pain, and death. No one saw it because no one was there. For this reason, we should not refer to evolution as a theory, but rather a hypothesis because there is no data relating to this process that can be tested or verified. And no matter how hard Hollywood tries, no one can go back in time to see whether this idea really happened. You merely need to choose whether you want to believe this idea or not. In the same way, it is true that no one was there when God supernaturally created the earth with everything in and around it. No one but God. The difference is that God supplied us with a trustworthy record of the creation account as revealed in his word, and we choose through his great mercy to believe it. In creation science, we believe that the Bible is authoritative on every matter that it covers, including the fact that it supplies the most trustworthy record of historic events. And that is really what it's all about, history. Even if one does not accept its divine origin, its status as a reliable historic account has been upheld repeatedly by archaeology. Now, what do we make of all the so-called scientific evidence of evolution? Science and the evidence in itself is not the problem, but rather the problem lies in the interpretation of the evidence or the results. Because the truth is, whether we like to admit to this or not, we are all prejudiced to some degree. Let's say two people are looking at the same evidence, in this case, a white piece of paper, but one has blue glasses on and the other has pink ones on, they will not see the evidence in the same way. One will see it as tinted blue and the other as tinted pink. And that's exactly how it works in the subject of evolution versus creation. If you've already decided that evolution must be true with pink lenses on, then you, your view of the world as well as everything in and around it will be totally different from someone who has decided that evolution cannot be true with their blue lenses on. And you know what? No one ever walks around without tinted lenses. No one ever stands completely neutral regarding a specific subject. We are all prejudiced to some degree. Although both disciplines have also deal with factual data, it's very important to keep in mind that facts don't speak for themselves because the facts are dependent on the interpretation thereof which is again influenced by the specific colored lenses that you have on. So when an evolutionist and a young earth creationist stand next to the Grand Canyon, or when they are looking at a fossil, they are looking at the same evidence or data, but they will draw different conclusions on how these things came about because their starting point, their belief system differs. And this belief system determines the color of their lenses. So the issue here is not the evidence. We are looking at the same evidence, but rather whether people still believe in the authority of God's word. If ever there was a belief that you need a lot of faith for, it is certainly evolution because the scientific evidence is seriously lacking. We are dealing with a dispute about two different worldviews regarding the history of the universe. Dr. Jonathan Safati, in his well-known book, Refuting Evolution, explains that it is not necessarily a question of science versus religion, but rather the science of one religious view, atheism, naturalism, versus the science of another religious view, biblical theism. Your religious view will necessarily influence your attitude and how you approach the evidence. So the question is not who is being biased, but rather which bias is the correct bias with which to be biased. In fact, Dr. Michael Ord states that most people would be shocked to know that there is no scientific data from observations and experiments that contradicts anything in the Bible. Now, as mentioned, there is this idea in the world today that people who believe in the biblical creation don't really know what they are talking about. And Further, that they can't be true scientists since it's really a matter of science versus religion. Richard Dawkins, for example, says the following. It is absolutely safe to say that if you meet somebody who claims not to believe in evolution, that person is ignorant, stupid or insane or wicked. But I'd rather not consider that. 
I think it's already quite clear to you whether you choose to believe in evolution or in the biblical creation, both deal with faith. And although it is true that not every evolutionist is an atheist, it is an undeniable fact that evolution essentially has a purely atheistic basis. And the rejection of God is just as religious a position as a belief in God. Even though creationists have no problem admitting to their faith, evolutionists generally refuse to admit to this. But there's always an exception. Michael Roos says the following. Evolution is a religion. This was true of evolution in the beginning, and it is true of evolution still today. By the way, Christians built the first hospitals and universities. And since the various, the foundations of all the various scientific disciplines, including biology, geography, astronomy, chemistry, maths, were laid down by people who believed in the biblical creation, Christians were also the first real scientists. They were either the founders or co-founders or strongly involved in the development of these disciplines. A few of them are listed in my book, but that's not even close to a complete list. And this includes Louis Pasteur, Isaac Newton, Johann Kepler, Robert Boyle, Lord Calvin, Gregor Mendel, Ju uh, James Jewell, etc. Now, I think we can all agree that these people were rather brilliant. In fact, many of these men's research and analyses led to the very laws and concepts of science which brought about our modern scientific age. The various scientific disciplines clearly did not arise through atheists, but rather through Bible-believing Christians. And I think it's important that our children should be told about this. The chief aim of all investigation should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God, and by this, thinking God's thoughts after him. Johannes Kepler. Atheism is so senseless and odious to mankind that it never had many professors. When I look at the solar system, I see the earth at the right distance from the sun to receive the proper amounts of heat and light. This did not happen by chance. The true God is a living, intelligent, and powerful being. Overwhelming strong proofs of intelligent and benevolent design lie all around us. The atheistic idea is so nonsensical that I do not see how I can put it into words. So this was Lord Calvin, and the previous quote was by Isaac Newton. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. The atheistic evolutionist Lawrence Crowd said the following, every atom in your body came from a star that exploded. You are all stardust, so forget Jesus. The stars died so that you could be here today. On an Australian radio interview, he actually said the following. While I've recently in the United States just stating that teaching creationism is child abuse, and I think it is, God has a serious warning for people such as this. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come. But woe to that man by whom the offense comes. In the end, it is not whether we are interested in this subject or not, but rather that each and every one of us have a huge responsibility to equip ourselves with knowledge of the truth so that we are able to give an answer to all who should ask, especially our children, concerning the hope that is in us and the unchanging truthfulness of God's word. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. If you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God, you will do well. Now, Professor Krauss said that the so-called stardust, um, where did that come from? We are told that long, long, long ago, there was a big bang when nothing exploded, yet everything was formed. The laws of nature tells us that nothing caused the big bang. Now, how can nothing explode to form anything? What's to say everything in the universe? Now, the next time someone makes a statement like that, consider asking them this. Excuse me, were you there? Where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you have understanding. 
In other words, chaos became cosmos all by itself and particles changed into planets, palm trees, pepper moths and professors without any supernatural godly input. What is a big deal? The biggest deal of all is how you get something out of nothing. Don't let the cosmologists try to kid you on this one. They have not got a clue either. Despite the fact that they are doing a pretty good job of convincing themselves and others that this is really not a problem. In the beginning, they will say there was nothing, no time, space, matter or energy. Then there was a quantum fluctuation from which, whoa, stop right there. You see what I mean? Then they are away and before you know it, they have pulled a hundred billion galaxies out of their quantum hats. I'm not going to go into all the problems with the Big Bang model, but some of those issues are addressed in my book and in a full DVD series available online. But I just have to mention this one thing. The amount of matter in the universe does not support the Big Bang model. According to the March 1999 edition of Time magazine, this is listed as one of the biggest problems of the model. The calculated existing mass is less than 10% of what it should be if the Big Bang actually happened. In an attempt to solve this problem, Big Bangers postulate the existence of dark matter, something that is not directly observable and for which there is no empirical evidence. Why is this done? Well, they must invent unknown stuff, dark matter, with the right properties, the unknown God of the gaps, to get stars to form naturalistically. Because you see, there is no workable natural explanation for the formation of stars. The Big Bang model teaches that the sun and many other stars formed before Earth, while Genesis teaches that they were created on day four after Earth, only about 6,000 years ago, rather than 10 to 20 billion years ago. The gravitational pull in star clusters and systems is not enough to keep them together over billions of years. Several proposals have been formulated for star formation, but most of them need stars to begin with. Now, the god of the gaps, dark matter, is used to overcome the fundamental physics that naturally prohibits the collapse of a gaseous cloud to a star. In other words, dark matter supposedly gravitates, creating strong gravitational forces strong enough to overcome the resistance of the hot gas pressure in the cloud, causing the normal hydrogen matter to collapse into a star. Consequently, cosmologists tell us that we live in a universe filled with invisible, unobservable stuff, about 74% dark energy and 22% dark matter. Only 4% of the matter and energy uh, content of the universe is supposed to be the ordinary atoms that we are familiar with. In other words, dark matter and dark energy supposedly makes up 96% of the universe, meaning 96% of the universe apparently consists of something we know absolutely nothing about. Yet in 2005, Nobel laureate Stephen Chu, speaking to a large gathering of high school children at the Australian National University in Canberra, said the following, we now understand nearly all there is to know about the universe, except for a few small details, like what is dark energy and dark matter, which allegedly make up 96% of the stuff in the universe. Why invent this unknown stuff? Why invent a God to overcome established laws of physics to explain star formation? Such a huge leap of faith. You see, without dark matter, it just cannot happen. And astronomers will have to admit that materialism fails, that there's far more to the universe than hydrogen, helium, and some other heavier elements. In an open letter to the scientific community entitled Big Bang Theory Busted by 33 top scientists, the following statement is made. 
The Big Bang today relies on a growing number of hypothetical entities. Things that we have never observed, inflation, dark matter and dark energy are the most prominent examples. Without them, there would be a fatal contradiction between the observations made by astronomers and the predictions of the Big Bang theory. In no other field of physics would this continual recourse to new hypothetical objects be accepted as a way of bridging the gap between theory and observation. It would at least raise serious questions about the validity of the underlying theory. In his book, Evolution Exposed, Roger Patterson said the following, secularists claim that the biblical model is based on faith not on observable, repeatable, testable claims. However, the Big Bang is also based on faith. The original conditions of the Big Bang cannot be observed, tested, or repeated by humans, and neither can the creation of the universe by God. However, we do have an eyewitness account of the creation of the universe recorded for us by the Creator. Now we have a question. Do Genesis 1 and 2 contradict one another? Well, Jesus didn't think so. Jesus quoted from both Genesis 1.27 and 2.24 in Matthew 19, verse 3 to 6, referring to the same man and woman, Adam and Eve. Genesis 1, verse 1 to 2, verse 4a is a summary outline of all of creation, while Genesis 2, verse 4b elaborates on the events of day 6. Genesis 2 is not just another account of creation because it is nothing about the creation of the heavens and the earth, the atmosphere, the sea, the land, the sun, the stars, moon, sea creatures. Genesis 2 mentions only things directly relevant to the creation of Adam and Eve and their life in the garden that God had specifically prepared for them. Genesis 1 may be understood as creation from God's perspective. It is a big picture an overview of the whole, while Genesis 2 views the more important aspects from man's perspective. Interestingly, Jesus referred to Genesis 1 to 11 16 times. The real question here is, is a day really a day? 2 Peter 3 verse 8 is the verse often quoted and in support of the idea that a day is not really a day. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. The first thing to note is that the context, context has nothing to do with the days of creation. Also, this verse is not defining a day, because it doesn't say a day is a thousand years, but rather that it is as a thousand years. The correct understanding is derived from the context. The Apostle Peter is encouraging the reader not to lose heart because God sometimes seems slow at fulfilling his promises. God is patient and long-suffering since he does not wish anyone to be lost. Furthermore, it shows how God is not bound by time like we are. Again, it has nothing to do with the days of creation. The only exception to the fact that a day is a day is when we are dealing with time prophecies where the day for a year principle is used. John Morris explains, when the Hebrew word yom is modified by a number such as six days or the third day, as is some 359 times in the Old Testament outside Genesis 1, it always means a literal day. Furthermore, the words evening and morning, which always mean a true daily evening and morning, define Yom some 38 times through the Old Testament outside Genesis. Now, the nothing becomes everything idea is inconsistent with and violates very important, well-known laws of nature. The first and second laws of thermodynamics, the law of cause and effect, as well as the law of biogenesis. We'll just briefly look at each one separately. According to the first law of thermodynamics, matter cannot be created nor destroyed by pure natural processes, although it can change from one form into another. The total amount of mass energy in the universe remains constant. In Hebrews 11.3, it is confirmed by faith, 
we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is, what is seen was not made of what was visible. This very same law confirms that the present state of the universe is one of preservation, not innovation, as required by evolution. Hebrews 1 verse 1 to 3, through whom he also made the world and upholding all things by the word of his power. In other words, creation is sustained by our creator. It is not changing into something new. All other changes, whether it is by man or the forces of nature, are merely a rearrangement of that which already exists. The second law of thermodynamics teaches that the amount of usable energy, in other words, which is available for work, is running out, is running down, and that entropy is increasing to a maximum. This means that everything tends towards increasing disorder and degradation. This law further teaches that something which is unorganized cannot become organized by itself. There's constantly something that needs repair or order that needs to be re-established. I discuss the second law in more detail in another DVD series, but suffice to say this law also clearly points to the facts that the universe had a beginning because the universe is also running down and it cannot have been running down forever or it would have already run down. So we can also compare the universe to a clock that is winding down relentlessly with no ability to wind itself up again. It follows that the universe has not been in existence forever. Only God exists forever. And only God could have created it in this wound up state in the first place. According to this law, disorder increases. Everything becomes worse, not better. And that relates to the physical and the biological world. In other words, everything. Evolution teaches that everything started spontaneously on its own, including energy, and over long periods of time became better and better and better and self-organized all by itself, yet in direct opposition to the second law of thermodynamics. There's a relentless tendency for all systems of matter and energy, if they are left to themselves without some form of inherent pre-patterns program or applied intelligence to run down and decay, not to grow more complex. Mervyn-Lee evolutionists claim that the second law of thermodynamics does not apply to open systems, but only to closed systems. Now, this is false, as is stated by Dr. John Ross of Harvard. There are no known violations of the second law of thermodynamics. Ordinarily, the second law is stated for isolated systems, but the second law applies equally well to open systems. They're somehow associated, associated with a field of far from equilibrium thermodynamics, the notion that the second law of thermodynamics fails for such systems. It is important to make sure that this error does not perpetuate itself. Dr. Henry Morris further explains, the only resolution posed by the first and second laws is that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The so-called Big Bang theory of the origin of the cosmos, postulating a primeval explosion of space, mass, time, continuum at the start, beginning with a state of nothingness and then rapidly expanding into the present complex universe, contradicts both these laws as well as scripture. Since we are here, and everything around us is really there, we can ask, how did everything come about? Now, everything that has a beginning needs someone to make it. It needs a cause. God has no beginning. Therefore, he doesn't need a cause. From the second law of thermodynamics, we know that the universe had a beginning. Therefore, the universe had a cause. The universe cannot be self-caused, because that would mean that it existed before it came into existence, which would make absolutely no sense at all. Accordingly, nothing cannot produce anything, let alone everything in the universe. More specifically, time, space, matter, and energy could not have made itself because something that did not exist before 
cannot make anything. Remember me quoting the clever atheist evolutionist Professor Stephen Hawking stating that everything originated from nothing? The Bible teaches that only God can create something from nothing and that he also upholds what he created as explained earlier. The law of biogenesis simply teaches that life does not originate from non-living matter. Life only comes from life according to the law of biogenesis as laid down by Virchow and Pasteur and as determined by Jesus Christ, the way, the truth and the author of life. Now, when questioned on this fact, the fact that life cannot come from non-life, evolutionists such as Bill Nye simply respond by saying, well, we haven't figured that out yet, but that is what science is all about. Yet this is an established scientific law. Evolutionists have blind faith in the arbitrary belief that everything made itself. As the American theologian and writer R.C. Sproul says, nothing could be more irrational than the idea that something comes from nothing. The question on how did life begin poses one of the most fundamental challenges to evolutionists and honest evolutionists such as Prof. Andrew Knoll from Harvard admitted it straight out. We don't really know how life originated on this planet. Yet the overwhelming majority view view this uh, in the way that the geneticist Prof. Zostak and his co-researcher from Harvard points out. First, life arose from non-living matter around 3.7 billion years ago. The popular university textbook by McKee and McKee, The Molecular Basis of Life, stated as, follow, as follows, the earth was formed from a cloud of condensing cosmic dust and gas, about 4.5 billion years ago, life arose soon thereafter. Yet in 2011, the evolutionist John Horgan wrote an article for the Scientific American entitled, Psst, don't tell the creationists, but scientists don't have a clue how life began. The well-known scientist Paul Davies in the New Scientist stated, how could stupid atoms write their own software? Nobody knows. It is absurd for the evolutionist to complain that it is unthinkable for an admittedly unthinkable God to make everything out of nothing and then pretend that it's more thinkable that nothing should turn itself into everything. Sir Fred Hoyle was one of England's most well-known astronomers in the second half of the 20th century. He was not a creationist and he was not a Christian. He spent decades searching for answers to the origin of life and the universe. And um, in his 1950 BBC radio series called The Nature of the Universe, he mockingly referred to this idea of an explosion as an ancient explosion as a Big Bang. And he described it as preposterous. Yet this term became applicable to this very day in spite of the discrimination Royal later endured for his anti-evolutionary views. He pointed out the impossibility of a Big Bang in his book, Evolution from Space, and he described it as nonsense of the highest order. He explained how the random emergence of a simple cell was just as unlikely as a tornado sweeping through a junkyard and by chance assembling a Boeing 747 from the materials it contained. Hoyle concluded that the fine tuning of the universe pointed to a designer. You see, the whole idea that living organisms spontaneously arose from non living matter, that it spontaneously organized itself into, to, into the first living cell, is not only impossible, it is completely unscientific. Furthermore, the cell itself is immensely complex. In fact, the composition and functioning of a single cell is more complex than the functioning of an entire city. Keep in mind how many people are required to build that city. No human invention can compete with a technical brilliance invented uh, in even the most basic cell. Not even the most advanced computer 
nor the cleverest scientist in the whole world is able to build even a single cell. No one can. May we then ask the evolutionary supporters, where did the first cell come from? Who made that cell? And where did life come from? Now, in spite of the fact that the law of cause and effect teaches that something that didn't exist before cannot produce anything spontaneously, nor can something get organized all by itself, according to the second law of thermodynamics, nor can life originate from non-life, according to the law of biogenesis, people still believe that all life came from some primordial pond scum, which came from nothing. In other words, all the small complex structures and contents within the cell had to come together all at once with a cell wall around it and voila, there we have a cell. So let's say we have a test tube which contained the perfect solution in terms of pH, temperature and salt for a living cell to be able to survive. And you add one living cell to the test tube. It has everything it needs to survive. Now you poke a little hole into the cell so that the contents can leak out. All the molecules themselves are still there in that small test tube, yet you still cannot make a living cell. You cannot put Humpty Dumpty together again. So what makes anyone consider the possibility that a few amino acids dissolved in some primordial ocean is going to produce a living cell? It's completely unrealistic and they know it. In fact, all observations to date indicate that unguided chemistry would destroy the components needed for life rather than build them, which is why scientists admit nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals spontaneously organized itself into the first living cell. Furthermore, complex molecules in the simplest living things cannot reproduce alone. Outside the cell, they break down. Inside the cell, they cannot reproduce without the help of another complex molecule. Enzymes are needed to produce a special energy molecule called ATP, but energy from ATP is needed to produce enzymes. Similarly, DNA is required to make enzymes, but enzymes are required to make DNA. Proteins can be made only by a cell, but a cell can only be made with proteins. The extraordinary complex molecules that make up a cell, RNA, DNA, proteins, seem designed to work together. Harold Morovich, a microbiologist, microbiologist, calculated the odds of a cell randomly assembling under the most ideal conditions to be one chance in 10 to the power of 100 billion. This is just to bring the material together it is still not a lie. It does not contain any information, any intelligence. Every molecule in the cell must know what to do, and then that cell must know how to divide and become more complex. And somewhere in this process, abstract qualities such as love and courage and respect must be added. The list is endless. If the list is endless, what are the chances Statistically, it is an utter impossibility. To quote Dr. Subot Pandit, it was an intelligently supervised event, not a random event. Randomness cannot compete with intelligence. The hypothesis of evolution rests on the notion that a long series of fortunate accidents produced, a, produced life from non-life to start with. It then proposes yet another series of undirected accidents which produced the astonishing diversity and complexity of living things today. However, if the foundation of the theory, namely an explanation for the origin of life is missing, then what happens to all the other ideas that is built on this assumption? You know, a skyscraper would collapse if it had no foundation. The evolutionary hypothesis should collapse as it clearly has no explanation for the origin of life. Now, when we look at something as complex as the engine of a car, then we know that the engine didn't make itself. Someone designed that engine. And it's obvious that the engine design is far more intelligent than the engine itself. Now, back to that little cell, which is thousands of times more complex than the engine of a car. 
who or what made the first cell? Did it happen by accident over a very long time? It seems completely impossible to me. As so many other thousands of scientists have already discovered, a cell cannot survive on its own. It must be complete and fully functioning within a complete and fully functioning living being. This is the principle of irreducible complexity. Charles Darwin said, if it can be demonstrated, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Do you think the concept of a mousetrap might result in a breakdown of Darwin's theory? It seems so simple, consisting of only five pieces, a wooden platform, a hammer, spring, holding bar, and a trigger. This little trap is a brilliant example of irreducible complexity, a single system composed of several well-matched interacting parts that contribute to the basic function. Michael Behe explains that if any part of this system is removed, you won't be able to catch that mouse. In other words, the mousetrap will not be able to function as a mousetrap. You have to have all the components together with the right materials, shapes, and accurate configuration for it to function successfully. It would take some stretch of imagination to believe that a mousetrap evolved piece by piece. And since it can only accomplish its purpose with all five pieces present and in the correct configuration, it is irreducibly complex. In other words, you cannot reduce its complexity without entirely destroying its function. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and all their host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. And this statement in Psalms 33, 6 and 9 is in perfect harmony with Genesis 1, describing how the Creator God created entire systems of life instantaneously by the command of his word. He designed, created, and placed irreducibly complex systems in operation all at once, or else these systems would not have functioned. So let's get back to Darwin's challenge. Do living organisms have vital functions that require all parts to be there at once, meaning it could not be derived gradually by a series of useful intermediates? Darwin's theory is about to be broken down again. There are many examples, including the complex cell, the flagellum, the design of tears, the complex sonar system of dolphins and bats, and the genetic coding system that genetic coding system that is irreducibly complex. We'll talk some more on DNA in the next lecture, but let's just read this quote by Nobel laureate in medicine, Jacques Monod. But the major problem is the origin of the genetic code. It is meaningless unless translated. The modern cells translating machinery consists of at least 50 macromolecular components, which are themselves coded in DNA. The code cannot be translated otherwise than by products of translation. When and how did this circle become closed? It is exceedingly difficult to imagine. In other words, the instructions for making proteins that are encoded in the DNA cannot be decoded unless you've already made some proteins using those machines to make the proteins. It's like having a CD with the instructions on the CD telling you how to make the CD. So how do you make the CD? DNA could not have come about by random processes since it is irreducibly complex. Michael B. he invites the writer or the reader or his book to imagine the following scenario. You enter a room and you see a body crushed on the floor, flat as a pancake. You observe how a dozen detectives crawl around examining the floor in great detail with their magnifying glasses for any clue to the identity of the perpetrator. In the middle of the room, right next to the pancake body, stands an enormous gray elephant. There's an elephant in a global laboratory full of scientists who are trying to explain the development of life. The elephant is labeled intelligent design, yet they still can't see him. Biochemical systems were designed, not by chance, nor necessity, nor the laws of nature, 
but they were planned and designed by the master designer. For every house is built by someone, but he who builds all things is God. Now, when we look at the design in all the complex living organisms around us, and even in the non-living matter, why would we even consider the possibility that there is no designer? An incredibly complex being with immensely complex little cells was created by a far more intelligent and unfathomably almighty designer. If you don't believe in miracles, perhaps you've forgotten you are one. Could it be that the almighty God is the intelligent master designer? With my feet firmly anchored in the word of the living God, and as confirmed by everything we know today, I am left with no other possibility. The difficulties of belief may be great, but the absurdities of unbelief are greater. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, say the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, there are many reasons why people are interested in the field of creation science. For me personally, there is one reason that stands out above the rest, and it deals with the many tragic consequences of evolution. Now, during the 19th century, Ernest Haeckel was one of the most enthusiastic supporters of Darwinism. He was a professor in zoology, a marine biologist, and a qualified medical doctor. But he's mostly famous for his fraudulent diagrams. In 1868, based on his enthusiastic support of Huxley's idea of abiogenesis, he produced a whole ra range of fake diagrams in which he compared the so-called similarities of human embryos with animals um, as proof that everything alive had one common ancestor. So the human embryos are initially depicted as identical to those of various animals, after which it goes through a whole range of evolutionary changes, including having gills like a fish and a tail like an ape, etc. So the human embryo supposedly passes through a fish stage, amphibian stage, reptile stage, etc. It's often referred to as a law of recapitulation, or Haeckel's term, the biogenetic law. Well, that law doesn't exist, and the whole idea is today dismissed as false. This idea even appeared in the world's best-selling children care book by Dr. Benjamin Spock. He stated that watching a baby grow is full of meaning because the development of each, each individual child retraces, but retraces to what? The whole history of the human race, physically and spiritually, step by step. Babies start off in the womb as a single tiny cell, just the way the first living th thing appeared in the ocean. Weeks later, as they lie in the amniotic fluid in the womb, they have gills like fish. Toward the end of the first year of life, when they learn to clamber to their feet, they're celebrating that period millions of years ago when our ancestors got up off all fours. In 1874, Professor Hiss pointed out Hackle's fraudulent alterations. Now, this year, that is 146 years ago, Professor Hiss sarcastically said that. Since Hackle taught at Jenna, home at the time of the finest optical equipment available, Hackle had no excuse for his inaccuracy. And Hackle even admitted somewhat that he was guilty. Now, Michael Richardson is currently a professor of animal development at Leiden University in the Netherlands. And even though he is not a creationist, he said he always knew that there was something wrong with Hackle's drawings. In addition, there was no record of anyone actually comparing embryos of species. So Prof. Richardson assembled an international team to examine and photograph the external form of 39 embryos from a wide range of vertebrate species at a stage comparable to that depicted by Hackle. Already in 97, the results were established and this photo with thanks and appreciation to Prof. Richardson shows how the different creatures that they investigated were all so radically different, different that Hackle's drawings could not possibly have been done from real specimens. He further explained that all vertebrates have a series of folds or ridges in their throat area about halfway through their development, but these folds are not gills in the early stages at all. 
Nigel Hawkes interviewed Prof Richardson for the Times in London, and he described Hackle as an embryonic liar. This is one of the worst cases of scientific fraud. It is shocking to find somebody that one thought was a great scientist was deliberately misleading. It makes me angry. What Heckel did was to take a human embryo and copy it, pretending to take a, a human embryo and copy it, pretending that the salamander and the pig and all the others did the same at the same stage of development. They don't. These are fakes. Well, today, one of the most tragic consequences of this idea is the argument that the fetus is only in the fish stage, so you're only slicing up a fish, is still used by some abortionists to convince young, girl, young girls and women that killing their babies is okay. Dr. Carl Sagan describes the embryo as similar to a fish and how the face initially resembles that of a reptile and even a pig. Now that is a blatant lie. A human embryo never looks like a reptile, a reptile or a pig. A human embryo is always a human embryo. From the moment of conception, it is nothing else. It does not become human sometime after eight weeks. The unborn baby is a tiny, tiny human child. We can justifiably charge this evolutionary nonsense of recapitulation with responsibility for the slaughter of millions of helpless prenatal children, or at least for giving it a pseudoscientific rationale. We shall not murder. Well, Prof. Keith Thompson thought that this biogenetic law was, uh, that it doesn't exist anymore. It says it was finally exercised from biology textbooks in the 50s, as a topic of serious theoretic and inquiry, it was extinct in the 20s. It would be great if that was true, but unfortunately, these things still appear in our children's textbooks today. Uh, my daughter wrote her matric in 2017, and uh, Hackle's fraud was already exposed in 1874. So as I said, this is 146 years ago, and still this is occurring in our children's books. Thus, the public is unaware that its dollars are being squandered on funding of mediocre middle brow science or that its children are being intellectually starved as a result of outdated text and unenlightened teachers. Now, about half a century ago, when the amazing mechanism of the human immune system was first being discovered, Nobel Prize bio winning biologist Sir Peter Medawa declared that the survival of a child in a mother's womb contradicted immunological laws. The immune system normally detects foreign tissue in the body and reacts by setting up um, the killer T cell mechanism, which attacks these foreign tissue. Since the developing embryo is genetically distinct, in other words, foreign, we would expect the mother's immune system to attack it. And today we know that that is exactly what happens, but the baby survives this killer T cell attack by putting up a very specific defense, defense mechanism. Researchers at the Medical College of Georgia discovered that, that mammalian embryos produce a special enzyme that suppresses the mother's killer T cell just before the embryo attaches to the mother's uterus. And interestingly, in a human embryo, this happens on day six, which is a preparation day for day seven, when the embryo first attaches itself to the mother's womb so that it can draw nutrients from the mother's bloodstream. Very interesting. Now, one of the major arguments used by abortionists is that the embryo is just part of the mother's body and that she can do with the body as she pleases. But this research clearly shows that right from the beginning, the human embryo is not part of the mother's body. From the moment of conception, it has a unique and distinct genetic makeup with half of the, of the chromosomes from mom and the other half from, dam, from dad, recombining in unique ways. The very reason why the mother's defense system was identified as foreign. So the tiny unborn baby is an entirely separate entity, completely human from the very beginning, and we have no right to even contemplate ending his or her life. All right, I see we are running a little bit out of time, so I'm going to move on to the end. 
I want to end off with this quote by Martin Luther. I'm afraid that schools will prove to be the great gates of hell unless they diligently labor in explaining the Holy Scriptures, engraving them in the hearts of youth. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Every institution in which men are not increasingly occupied with the word of God must become corrupt. All right, so this is the end of this presentation. Um, in the next presentation, we'll have a good look at genetics and uh, mutations, and we will see if it is at all possible for evolution to occur. Well, wow, thank you so much, um, Nicolene, for that informative and really thought-provoking presentation. Um, I'm just going to open the floor in case there are any questions um, that attendees may like to ask you. Um, so if you as an attendee have a question, uh, just unmute yourself and feel free to ask. I have a question, uh, and you might, um, uh, what's the word, address it in one of your later um, presentations. But I think I heard you say that you believe in um, a young earth. Did I, did I got that? Cut? So I'm wondering, in what you said, I don't see that there is a, it doesn't contradict yet at least, an old earth. So I'm wondering if you uh, can tell me why this is. Yes, absolutely. The, the presentation that we have none done now is my is my microphone on. Yep. Okay. That is not what we are addressing specifically in this first lecture. Mm -hmm. If you are interested in the age of the Earth as such, my full DVD series is available online through Amazing Discoveries, and I think that would be lecture number three or four, and uh, we discuss that in detail. So there's quite a lot of evidence for a young Earth, including radiometric dating. We have the sedimentary strata that we see today uh, forming very quickly uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, eruption of the Mount St. Helens volcano. Um, in the 1980s, we were able to see some very interesting um, examples of what would have happened in the flood, the rapid formation of valleys, of sedimentary strata, of um, upright fossilized trees that we find today in the sedimentary strata stretching through various levels, le levels that are supposed to differ by millions of years that were formed and entombed rapidly by the eruption of that volcano. So there's a lot of evidence for a young earth, but that is addressed in a different lecture. Cool, thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry, I, I think Zipporah stole part of her question. Um, but I was just going to ask quickly, you, you probably would give a similar answer, but I think uh, it's probably worth asking still anyway. Um, even though we have scientists, even among uh, the, the Christians, who believe in, in the flood and everything that it happened about, uh, well, 3,500 years ago and stuff like that, and the fossils, you know, uh, where um, where they are, the, whether they're flat or whether they're upright, the trees or whatever, whether it was a catastrophic and stuff like that. There's still um, a group of people who do believe, though, in that the earth itself, the ball itself, the matter itself, at the beginning, where it says in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, that the ball itself existed before uh, God started working on it. Um, so I don't know whether uh, this is something that can be addressed or is something that you also mentioned in your, in your, uh, in your uh, lectures as well. Yes, that, that basically addresses what we call the gap theory. And um, I think that is a completely different lecture that we need to do on its own because there is so many factors to consider and um, that is actually for me one of the main purposes of doing this presentation to you because I want to see what the struggles are that you have specifically. We recently did a whole 
well, we, we have a WhatsApp group where we, dis, where we discuss the, the gap theory. We have a soft, uh, soft gap, which is, uh, it does not involve uh, the factor of ruin. And then we have the classical gap theory where there is uh, a ruin involved as well. And there's a lot of detail involved there. So if uh, this is something that you would like me to do, I will certainly... Uh, work out a complete lecture for you to address that question. But there's, there's quite a lot of aspects to consider when we talk about the possibility of an old earth. Um, if we just take Genesis 1 verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Heavens and earth is what we call a merism. A merism is basically where you take two alternates and you include everything in between. For example, if you say I painted the house from top to bottom that means you in, you painted the entire house so genesis 1 1 is basically a statement saying that god created everything in the beginning and in the beginning is the beginning of time and by using the biblical chronology and adding up the genealogies we know that the beginning was at least six thousand years ago we don't have an exact date for that but approximately six thousand years ago so that is that is basically the foundation that we work on. All right, okay, yeah. thank you. That's just that there are some people who think okay, it was dark and then God came and switched the lights on and then he started working on what was dark before. Yes, I yes, I've heard that before. Now, darkness is simply the absence of light. Darkness is not something like light is something. Um, so basically, the first day begins with darkness as the days work today day one begins with darkness and um, so if this if this if there was a gap then you would sit on day one with half a day we would not be able to logically put the chronological events of of uh, genesis together if there was if we take anything away from day one so in the beginning uh, there was darkness because day one began began with darkness thank you Uh, well, uh, I have one more question. Um, where can we watch all of your uh, uh, lectures? Okay, that should be quite easy to find. Um, you can just uh, type in my name. You can Google that. Mm -hmm. And all of it is hosted by Amazing Discoveries. Mm -hmm. um, so you should be able to find it very easily. I think if you just Google my name and click on videos, all of it is there, as well as my interview that I did with Professor Walter Fife with my testimony. It's all available for free online, English and Afrikaans, but I don't think you'll be interested in the Afrikaans. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure. Um, I have a question. Um, my question is, where and why did the theory of um, existence of dinosaurs come from? Could you please repeat the theory of? Um, the theory of the existence of dinosaurs comes from, because I'm a bit confused. I'm sorry, I, I can't hear. The theory of existence of? Dinosaurs, dinosaurs. Oh, dinosaurs. I'm sorry. All right. Okay, dinosaurs are simply land animals that breathed air. And land animals that breathed air were all created on day six, together with human beings. Now, so in other words, dinosaurs lived and existed in the Garden of Eden. And what makes dinosaurs interesting is that reptiles, um, theoretically, can continue growing for as long as they live, whereas mammals reach uh, at, at, at maturity, they stop growing, but reptiles can continue growing. So it follows that the longer they lived, the bigger they grew. So definitely they did exist. We find ample evidence of their existence in uh, the fossil record. And we have very, very interesting results these days. It was actually um, found by an evolutionist called Mary Schweitzer of their young age. They actually detected soft tissues, um, blood vessels, red blood cells, proteins were extracted from uh, dinosaur bones and quite a few of them already 
which actually is another uh, confirming evidence of their young age. They've even detected, they were able to uh, detect carbon-14 in their bones. And in fact, carbon-14 has been detected all through the fossil record, which is a very powerful evidence for a young creation because carbon-14 cannot be detected over a limit of around 80,000 years, which is a practical, a uh, a theoretical uh, age limit but that is also discussed in my um, I do a whole lecture on dinosaurs in the Bible and also radiometric dating so definitely dinosaurs did exist plesiosaurs were basically the uh, um, water reptiles and pterosaurs were the flying reptiles so uh, to correctly uh, refer to dinosaurs dinosaurs are the land living reptiles Thank you. My pleasure. Did that answer your question sufficiently? <laughs> yes, it did. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Oh, sorry, I must just say one more thing about that. Just remember the word dinosaur was only invented in the 1800s. So that's, that's why the word dinosaur does not occur in the Bible. What it, whereas the Bible translations happened in the 1500s and 1600s. So the reason the word dinosaur is not in there is because it did not exist yet. But there's uh, lots of references to dinosaur type animals in the Bible, uh, specifically behemoth and leviathan that is also discussed in my uh, lectures. Hi, hello, I have a question as well. I'm Rebecca. Um, hey, Rebecca. Um, I was wondering um, how reliable is uh, radiometric dating and is radiometric dating including the radiocarbon dating because I have seen uh, other presentations by other creationists using um, evidence of how radiocarbon dating is not reliable because they have actually been able to date uh, animals uh, you know that were basically living um, you know, um, in the present of like with tens of thousands of years of, uh, ago. So I was just wondering how much our creationists really relying on this uh, form well, of Well, that is a, is a very good question. Well, the, the short answer is no. The methods are not reliable. Radiometric dating, um, and I, I really hope that you are able to go and watch the complete um, uh, lecture that I did on that, but just for interest sake, if we just take the Earth, um, radiometric dating of the Earth at 4.6 billion years was not even done by using Earth rocks, but rather by dating a group of meteoritic rocks um, with the assumption that the meteorites came from the same parent asteroids formed at the same time of the Earth um, from the solar nebulae. So in other words, they start with a huge assumption to prove yet another assumption. Now, there is actually no scientific method in existence that can determine the age of the Earth or the universe. The idea of millions of years is actually held by assuming that the rate of change of various processes in the past was exactly the same as it is today. We call that uniformitarianism. So they believe, evolutionists and long ages believe that the present is the key to the past. Now, when you're doing, when you're dating with radiometric dating, the relative concentrations um, as measured of, of a parent product, that decays radioactively into its various daughter products. And it happens in very specific steps where the different concentrations of isotopes or daughter products are, they, that are formed, they can be measured quite accurately. And now these techniques are used on rocks, specifically igneous rocks, such as volcanic rocks. And it's normally presumed to indicate the age when that rock crystallized. But concentrations are not ages and rocks are not clocks. So to infer ages from such concentrations, first of all, requires the proposal and acceptance of a whole bunch of unprovable assumptions. In other words, all radiometric dating begins with assumptions. 
for example, let's say they, you take an hourglass, which now represents a rock specimen of unknown age. And the sand in the top is supposed to represent the parent isotope, which have not yet decayed. Now, as that parent isotope disintegrates or decays, it forms the daughter products in the bottom. So that's the sand accumulating in the bottom. And the half-life of that isotope is represented by the narrowness of that hourglass. The smaller the opening, the slower the trickle of sand may be. Now, how do we know, first question, how do we know the conditions in the beginning? So they already assume they know the conditions in the beginning. How do we know that there weren't daughter products already uh, present at the beginning, in other words, at the bottom of the hourglass. How do we know in which quantities or ratios these isotopes were present? Um, they also assume that the system is closed, in other words, that no parent or daughter isotopes could have been added or could have, could have gone missing. So that's the second assumption. And thirdly, they assume that the rate of decay has always been the same. Now, what makes it interesting is that when we have rocks of a known age, in other words, let's say Mount St. Helens, um, where we know that the rocks are, let's say, 50 years old when they started to crystallize, they use different methods to test the accuracy of these radiometric datings. And the results differed by hundreds of thousands to millions of years from the known age of 50 years. So if radiometric methods cannot even date rocks with a known age, how can we trust them to date rocks of an unknown age? Carbon-14 is a little bit different. Uh, it works a little bit different to radiometric dating because um, you cannot use carbon-14 dating on rocks. Carbon-14 can only be used on something that once contained carbon. In other words, that was living at one point. And with carbon dating, um, because it has such a rapid decay rate, the, the decay rate is 5,730 years. So after 5,730 years, half of that carbon-14 would have decayed away. And after another 5,730 years, half of that half, in other words, a quarter, another quarter will be gone. Now only a quarter of the original amount is left. So after about 10, well, we can actually work on six to eight half lives or 40 to 60,000 years. There's so little carbon-14 left that you can hardly even measure it. And we're not even close to 100,000 years yet. In other words, if all the carbon-14 have now disappeared under 100,000 years of age, we would not expect to find even one carbon-14 atom in the presence of a fossil of a dinosaur that is supposedly 65 million years old. Yet they have detected carbon-14 all through the fossil record. Now, there are various assumptions with the carbon-14 dating that you also have to keep in mind, especially the conditions surrounding the flood. So I really hope that you are able to go and watch the radiometric dating video or, or presentation online. And uh, if you have any other questions, you are most welcome to, to contact me about that. But the short answer, that was the long answer, but the short answer is no, radiometric dating is not trustworthy at all. All right, thank you. Asia. Okay, we'll take one more question. Um, Stefan, I see that you're, you've raised your hand. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, I'm an engineer, and so basically I have a pretty cynical view of uh, like science in general, but uh, basically the science I respect is like science that like gives results. So as opposed to this um, like theory of evolution and uh, Big Bang and stuff, does do, do you know some examples of like where the creationist view um, has shown some like practical advantages or discoveries, something experimental that we can show? 
Well, yeah. I think probably the most important is actually going to be answered in the, in the second presentation. When God created the living animals, he said that they would produce after their own kind. And that is exactly what we see today. We have species forming. We have variations forming. But all of the formation of these species and varieties is still according to the kind. If we take the dog kind, for example, I'm going to explain that in detail in the next lecture. The wolves, the foxes, the jackals, the coyotes, they're all part of the same dog kind. But there has never been any change of kind. And that is what is predicted by the evolutionary model. They, they need a change of kinds. So to this very day, with all the research that they have done in baromenology, where they try and um, find out what was the original created kind, we still see that the, the reproduction is always based on the kind. And then another prediction that I can maybe just uh, give to you, uh, Dr. Ra Dr. Russell Humphreys, uh, quite a few years ago in the 80s, predicted based on a young creation, a young universe, a young Earth, he made some very interesting calculations regarding magnetic fields on the planets of Uranus and uh, oh, I've forgotten the other one's name now, Uranus and uh, I think it was Neptune, I can't remember. And then with the Voyager that flew past there in the 80s, um, he predicted that the magnetic fields on Uranus would, would be at least, at least 10,000 times more than that's expected by the evolutionists on these cold planets. They did not expect magnetic fields to be present there at all. And this was actually confirmed um, before, before the Voyager even got to these areas. So yes, there's, there's quite a number of things we can talk about, um, but I hope that answers at least some of your questions. Yeah, yes, thank you. That's very interesting. Yeah. Pleasure. Okay, so we'll um, end here with the first session. Uh, the second session will uh, start at 3.15 at p.m. Um, so do feel free to um, get some water. Um, and there will be a separate link which you can find um, under the lobby in the agenda for the second uh, half of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.